Our next speaker is Celine Atasoy. She will be talking about the enhanced improvisation in brain processing by LSD, exploring neutral correlate, correlates of LSD experience with connectosome specific harmonic waves. Celine At um, Atasoy, PhD, is a chem a computational neuroscientist and a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Brain and Cognitive and Cognition. You know, oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to pronounce this. <laughs> Universitat Pompidou, Barcelona. You're going to have to you're going to have to correct me on that one. <laughs> Her current research focuses on exploring the brain dynamics in consciousness, sleep, psychedelic states, as well as psychiatric disorders uh, by analysis, fMRI, and MEG data within the mathematical framework of harmonic waves. Please welcome the saint, Selena. Thank you. Thank you. Am I on? Okay. Well, thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm Selena Tassoy. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at, I know it's difficult to pronounce, uh, University of Pompeu Fabra um, at the Center for Brain and Cognition. And it's, it's really great pleasure to present you the work, the recent work that we did actually in collaboration with the, uh, our colleagues from the Division of Brain Sciences at Imperial College London who uh, collected this beautiful LSD data I will present and with the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Oxford. So in this study, um, yeah, sorry. So in this study where we actually observed um, enhanced improvisation in brain processing by LSD, uh, what we did was we, uh, we explored the neural correlates of the LSD experience uh, using a new method, a new technique that is based on connectome-specific harmonic waves. So because the technique is kind of new and may sound a bit unfamiliar and maybe a bit complicated, but I guarantee it's not. So I want to first um, start introducing you the technique, uh, the connectome-specific harmonic waves, what it is. And maybe even before doing so, I want to give you first um, an intuitive understanding for what I mean with harmonic waves in general. So I'm going to show you a very short, uh, very short video which illustrates really nicely examples of these harmonic waves in a phenomenon called cymatics. So I, have, I hope you have noticed these beautiful sand patterns that were emerging on the metal plate when he was playing a musical note on the keyboard. Now this is happening because any system that is capable of vibrating, even a simple metal plate, has certain uh, preferred frequencies called its natural frequencies or resonance frequencies. And if you manage to excite the system with one of these natural frequencies, then it will resonate and it will form standing waves. Now, these standing waves actually partition the domain, the metal plate, into parts that oscillate like up and down synchronously. And of course, the sand accumulates at the boundaries of these regions, forming these very complex and pretty sand patterns. Now, the shape of this sand pattern or the standing wave is actually determined only by two factors. One of them is the geometry of the metal plate. So if you were to cut the metal plate in a different shape, the waves will automatically adapt themselves. And the second one is the frequency of vibration. So as you see in this example, for increasing frequency, we would observe increasingly complex standing wave patterns. And this is in fact how we create music. So for every single musical note, that we play in a musical instrument uh, where the frequency uh, of the vibration, frequency of vibration would correspond to the pitch of the musical note, there is an accompanying standing wave pattern emerging within the musical instrument. 
And even though these um, standing waves are seemingly very complex and very, very different from each other, they are actually all predicted by one simple equation. And um, I'm not going to go into the details of this equation, but I do want you to take away that actually this equation gives you a spatial component that is the harmonic wave or the standing wave and a temporal component that is related to the natural frequency, to this vibration frequency. And it's very um, remarkable because nature seems to be using this same equation over and over in various different natural phenomena. So the example I showed you was these uh, standing waves formed in acoustics, in cymatics. But the same harmonic waves, the same harmonic patterns actually also predict the electron orbits in quantum mechanics or electromagnetic interaction patterns that would emerge within a grid of ions. And probably uh, way more remarkable than any of these uh, physical examples, this, these um, harmonic waves also provide the building blocks of biological pattern formation and morphogenesis. So these harmonic waves are the building blocks of the very complex patterns that we observe in nature on animal coats. And in fact, if you were to cut the metal plate in shape of an animal's skin, and if you were to capture the standing waves, uh, the vibration modes of that particular geometry, you would see that they would resemble different types of animal code patterns for different frequencies. So these are all examples of harmonic waves in general in nature. And what we did in this technique is um, we, we applied this principle of harmonic waves to the anatomy of the human brain. So we made them connectome specific. So first of all, um, what do I mean with the human connectome? Now, um, today, thanks to the recent developments in, um, in structural neuroimaging techniques, such as um, diffusion tensor imaging, we can trace the long-distance white matter connections in the human brain. So these, these long-distance dis long white matter fibers, as you see in this image, uh, connect distant parts of the human brain, distant parts of the cortex. And the set of all of these connections is termed the human connectome. Now, because we know the equation that is governing these harmonic waves, we can extend them, extend this principle to the human brain simply by solving the same equation on the human connectome instead of the metal plate or the anatomy of the zebra. And if we do that, we get a set of harmonic patterns, this time emerging on the cortex. And so we decided to call these harmonic patterns connectome harmonics. And um, each of these connectome harmonic patterns is actually associated with a different frequency. Now, because they correspond to different frequencies, they're all independent. And together, they give you a new language, so to speak, to describe neural activity. So the same way that the harmonic patterns are actually building blocks of these uh, complex patterns that we see on animal coats, these connectome harmonics are actually the very building blocks of the, of the complex spatiotemporal patterns uh, of neural activity. And, sorry, and actually uh, describing neural activity or expressing neural activity by using these uh, connectome harmonics as brain states is really not very different than decomposing a complex musical piece into its musical notes. So it's simply a new way of representing your data or new language to express it. Then, um, what is the advantage of using this new language? So why not use um, the state-of-the-art conventional neuroimage analysis methods? Well, because these uh, harmonics, these connectome harmonics are by definition the vibration modes, but apply to the anatomy of the human brain, if we use them as brain states to express neural activity, we can compute certain fundamental principles 
very easily, such as the energy and the power. So the power would be the strength of activation of each of these states in neural activity. So how strongly that particular state contributes to neural activity. And the energy would be a combination of, of this strength of activation with the intrinsic energy of that particular brain state. And that intrinsic energy comes from the frequency of its vibration. So in the analogy of vibration. So in this study, um, we looked at the power and the energy of, of these connectome harmonic brain states in order to explore uh, neural correlates of the LSD experience. So we looked at uh, 12 healthy participants who received either a dose of LSD or a placebo. Um, and the, the, these two um, sessions were 14 days apart and counterbalanced order. And the functional magnetic resonance imaging scans uh, consist of three eyes closed resting state scans, each lasting seven minutes. Uh, in the first and the third scan, the participants were simply resting uh, eyes closed, but in the second scan, they were also listening to music. And after each scan, the participants rated the intensity of certain experiences. So if we if you look at, firstly, uh, at the total power and the total energy of each of these scans under LSD and placebo, what we see is that actually under LSD, both the power as well as energy of brain activity increases significantly. And if we, for example, compute the probability of observing a certain energy value in LSD or placebo, what we see is that the peak of this probability distribution clearly shifts towards high energy values under LSD. And that peak is even slightly higher in terms of probability when the subjects were listening to music. So if you interpret that peak as, in a way, um, like a characteristic energy of that particular uh, state, then we see that it shifts towards high energy under LSD, as well as this effect is um, intensified when they are listening to music. So um, then we asked which of these brain states, which of these frequencies were actually contributing to this energy increase. So we partitioned the spectrum of all of these harmonic brain states into different parts and computed the energy of each of these partitions individually. So in total, we have around uh, 20,000 or more than 20,000 brain states. And if we look at the energy differences in LSD and placebo, what we find is that uh, for a very narrow range of low frequencies here, actually, uh, these brain states were decreasing their energy under LSD. But for a very broad range of high frequencies, now this is logarithmic scale, so this part is actually much broader compared to this part. So for a very broad range of high frequencies, LSD was actually inducing uh, an energy increase. So this says that actually LSD alters brain dynamics in a very frequency-selective manner, and it was... Um, causing high frequencies to increase their energy. So next we looked whether these changes that we observe in brain activity actually correlated with any of the experiences that the subjects themselves were having um, in that moment. So if you look at the energy changes within the narrow range of low frequencies, we found that uh, the energy changes in that range actually significantly correlated with the intensity of the experience of ego dissolution, so the uh, loss of subjective self. And very interestingly, the same range, the energy changes within the same range also significantly correlated with the intensity of emotional arousal, whether the emotion was positive or negative. And this could be um, quite relevant for studies looking into potential therapeutic use of LSD. So next, uh, when we looked at slightly higher range of frequencies, uh, what we found was that there, the, the energy changes within that range significantly correlated with the positive mood. So this really suggests that it's rather the low frequency brain states that, uh, which correlate with the experience of ego dissolution 
or with the emotional arousal, and it's the activity of higher frequencies that is correlating with the, with the positive experiences. So next, we wanted to look at um, how many brain states were actually contributing. So we, we wanted to check the size of the repertoire of active brain states. And if we look at the probability of uh, activation for any brain states, so we are not distinguishing for different frequency brain states in this, in this plot, what we observed was the probability of a brain state being silent, so zero contribution, as you see here, actually decreased under LSD. And the probability of a brain state contributing really strongly, which corresponds to the tails of this distribution, was actually increasing under LSD. So this suggests that uh, LSD was activating actually more brain states simultaneously. And if we go back to the musical analogy that we used in the beginning, that would actually correspond uh, to playing more of these musical notes at the same time, simultaneously. And it's, it's fairly interesting because studies who have looked at improvising, uh, uh, as studies who looked at jazz improvisation, they have found that improvising jazz musicians actually play significantly more musical notes compared to memorized play. And this is what we seem to be finding under uh, the effect of LSD, that your brain is actually activating more of these brain states simultaneously. And it does so in a very non-random fashion. So if you look at the correlation across different frequencies, so like the co-activation patterns, their co-activation over time, and you may interpret it as um, the communication across different frequencies, what we found is actually for a very broad range of uh, the spectrum, there was a higher correlation across different frequencies uh, in their activation patterns under LSD compared to placebo. So this really says that LSD uh, is actually causing a reorganization rather than a random activation of brain states. So it is actually expanding the repertoire of active brain states while maintaining, or maybe better said, uh, recreating a complex but spontaneous order. And in the musical analogy, it is really very similar to jazz improvisation, um, to think about it in an intuitive way. Now, um, there is actually one particular situation when dynamical systems, such as the brain, systems that change their activity over time, actually show this type of um, emergence of complex order or enhanced uh, improvisation and, and, and enhanced repertoire of active, active states. And this is when they approach uh, what is called criticality. Now, criticality is actually this type of uh, special type of behavior or special type of dynamics that emerges right at the transition between order and chaos. When these two types of, two extreme types of dynamics uh, are in balance. And criticality is actually said to be the constantly shifting battle zone between stagnation and anarchy the one place where a complex system can be spontaneous, adaptive, and alive. So, if a system is approaching criticality, then there are very characteristic signatures that you would observe in your data, in the relationships uh, that you plot in your data. And one of them is, and probably the most characteristic one of them, is the emergence of power laws. So, what does that mean? If we plot one observable in our data, which, for example, in our case, would be the maximum power of a brain state, in relationship to another observable, for example, the wave number or the frequency of that brain state, so if we plot them in the logarithmic coordinates, that would mean uh, if, they follow a if they follow power laws, they would follow a line. And this is exactly what we observed, actually, in our data, and surprisingly for both, for LSD as well as for placebo, but with one very significant and remarkable difference. 
So because the high frequencies actually increase their power, this distribution uh, follows this power law, this line, way more accurately under LSD compared to placebo. And here you see the error of the fit, which is decreasing. So this suggests actually um, that LSD shifts brain dynamics further towards criticality, or the signature of criticality that we find in LSD and in placebo is way more enhanced, way more pronounced um, under the effect of LSD. And we found the same effect not only for the maximum power, but also for the mean power, as well as for power fluctuations. So this suggests that the criticality actually Maybe the, the principle that is underlying this uh, emergence of complex order and this reorganization of brain dynamics, and uh, which leads to enhanced improvisation in, in brain activity. So, um, to summarize briefly, what we found was that LSD increases the total power as well as total energy of brain activity. It selectively activates high-frequency brain states, and it expands the repertoire of active brain states in a very non-random fashion. And the principle underlying all of these changes seems to be a, a reorganization of brain dynamics right at criticality, right at the edge of chaos, or just at the balance between order and chaos. And um, very interestingly, the edge of chaos or the criticality, edge of criticality, is said to be where life has enough stability to sustain itself and enough creativity to deserve the name of life. So I leave you with that <laughs> and thank you all for your attention. Uh, hi, that was a um, very uh, interesting uh, sort you. of description of um, how to sort of break down brain function. Um, I'm curious, the idea to sort of use harmonic patterns to describe, uh, I guess maybe first a clarifying question, is the harmonic patterns, is that describing the spatial distribution? Yes. Only, yeah. okay, not the temporal aspects of it. Um, yeah, well, so. the harmonic patterns themselves are spatial, but um, we have the fMRI over time. So for each time point, we are decomposing the cortical activity into these harmonics. So we have a harmonic decomposition over time, so gotcha. activation over time. Okay. Um, I'm curious, the, so sort of the increase in high frequency spatial harmonics versus the low frequency would suggest more of a shift in brain function from integrated... Uh, information transfer across large regions towards a more of a small world topology, uh, kind of more small modules working mm -hmm. separately. Um, and in describing it in terms of harmonic patterns, is there any advantage to that versus looking at it from more of a sort of a network or connectionist perspective? Actually, uh, for example, because default mode network is mentioned a lot um, in the analysis of this type of data, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll uh, yeah. Default mode network would be one of the low frequency harmonics. Mm -hmm. the, act the deactivation of the low frequencies uh, would actually correspond to more, many of these um, cognitive networks being slightly deactivated. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the biggest advantage that it brings is the is first, it's intuitive to understand that way. Uh, and you can actually map um, different, different networks to different, um, different harmonic patterns, which we showed in our earlier uh, publication. Uh, but it is also uh, relates to the spatial and temporal activities. So it gives you like from, it changes from space and time and to right? time and frequency <clears throat> in a way where you can do different types of analysis, which reveals uh, certain information that is present but not easily observable in the normal representation. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you so much for uh, sharing. This is uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, interesting, intriguing, and uh, I Thank love where you. this is going. Um, have you observed this effect with uh, light pulsing or other non-audible inputs? Sorry, have you Have you observed this, uh, this phenomenon 
with lights pulsing or other non-audible inputs? Um, Not sound, but maybe uh, light or... Uh, you mean or harmonic waves in general, not in the Like these, frequency, these frequencies uh, affecting uh, the brain activity. Um, have, you tr have you tried this uh, with light or with uh, uh, skin pulsing? Uh, we haven't. No, we okay. haven't. So far, uh, we have only looked at resting state neural activity. And the only uh, input uh, or stimulation that you can think of in this study would be music because uh, subjects had their eyes closed in the scanner as well, but yeah, we haven't yet. Um, I was just wondering whether, you know, given that the connectome is this kind of spiky ball, um, like what kind of distance function did you use in order to like be able to create and understand these standing waves? Like how did you actually make that mapping? Uh, well, actually, it's not only the spiky part, because we use the cortical surface, and we, on top of the cortical surface connections, uh, we include the connectome, so we include the long-distance connections. And uh, so we have a full connectivity of the human brain, and then we just solve, like, no distance function, we just solve that equation by using a uh, Laplace operator on a graph. Okay, so, so the we didn't, actual distance. Yeah, a, well... Like, we represent it as a graph, and then we apply the graph Laplacian, theoretically speaking, uh, on that graph. So we didn't need to compute any um, distance function explicitly. Hi, Hi I'm Sebastian. Uh, thank you for this amazing talk. Thank you for this amazing talk. Thank you. Um, I wondered if you were planning or if you did uh, modeling of this study as you did for the nature communication paper? Uh, for this study, no, we, we haven't done any modeling, uh, but I think it would be interesting to link it to uh, neurophysiological changes in the brain, but we haven't done it yet. Okay, is it planned? Um, maybe, potentially, like, okay. yeah, Thank you. Yeah, I have a question regarding the relationship between entropy and criticality. So yeah. in the 2014 uh, paper, the two were to a certain extent distinguished. And, you know, it can be said that the two actually are dissociated or can be dissociated. And here in the way you presented things, when you were speaking of, you know, chaos and order, it could be understood as an entropy and non-entropy, right? And so what's your view on, on the relationship between the two? Do you consider that, for example, LSD is better described as being, as uh, inducing criticality rather than entropy? I think it's a very important point. Um, so entropy can be thought of like the randomness in, in a system. And criticality, is, so uh, if you start from a very ordered point of view, very ordered regime, and approach criticality, you're increasing entropy. But uh, after a certain point, you're, for example, random noise would be probably would have probably higher entropy. But if you uh, were to go that far, then you're losing stability. So I think what criticality brings in is the trade-off between stability and flexibility or entropy. So. Uh, criticality could be thought of as having the maximum entropy while still maintaining a certain amount of pattern and functioning. So you're not going to the full randomness. You still have some structure in your system, but you're increasing entropy. Is the idea that the music itself um, that the patient is listening to has a, has a direct effect on, on the harmonic waves? And if so, um, is, is, uh, would it be, uh, I guess, a further area of study to sort of vary the music and see how, how that uh, affects the analysis you just described? Uh, that is definitely planned, I can tell you that. Uh, so next, what we want to do with the harmonics is also we want to look at uh, just music alone, um, apart from the LSD study, and if we can uh, predict any of, the, any of the changes in neural activity in these harmonics. Based on what I have, uh, based on my experience with this data, I think music affects a slightly uh, lower range of frequencies compared to LSD, so it's more or less mid-range mid frequencies, but that has to be still studied. Okay, thank you very much. 
What subjective experience accompanies entering the critical phase? Sorry, excuse me, couldn't hear. What subjective experience accompanies edit, edit, entering the critical phase? Uh, what subjective experience? I yes. mean, all these experiences were um, accompanying. So the whole system, the whole brain dynamics was approaching criticality. Yes. And we found, so different parts of the spectrum were correlating to different experiences. For example, for the ego dissolution and emotional arousal, it was rather the low frequency range. So criticality itself, I don't know if... Uh, can be claimed to correlate to one particular experience, but it's rather the whole uh, trip, I would say. Thank you. Thank you.